Welcome to this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizullah. Joining me today is Dr. Bradley Summer, Assistant Professor in Hematology and Oncology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and Senior Partner of the West Cancer Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Summer, excellent to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I would love for you to highlight your, the most important presentations or some of the important presentations with new data here at ASCO GU 2017. So uh, we'll talk through a little, couple of the highlighted uh, renal cell data that sure. I think is, uh, that I thought found interesting. Okay. Um, the first one, uh, Dave McDermott's uh, abstract uh, of atezolizumab uh, plus or minus bevacizumab uh, versus uh, sutinitinib uh, in front line. So I thought that that uh, had some interesting uh, data in that uh, it's a novel novel combination, looking at a novel combination, and it looked like there was some, uh, in the pdl one positive patients, there was some uh, interesting efficacy data and um, with less, potentially less toxicity. So he hasn't yet presented the data, but it looks uh, like it, 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 it's something to watch and it's in phase three, and I think that that's something that we'll sure. be keeping an eye on. Sure. Um, I think that... Uh, there was some very interesting data from Alan Ridwan that um, with the uh, registry data from uh, the from looking at small renal masses. So um, <clears throat> in that in that study, there was about 600 patients um, that had um, s small renal masses under four centimeters. And the question is, is how to best manage those patients? So. Um, whether to do primary intervention, either ablation or some other additional intervention, surgical resection, or just watch and watchful waiting or active surveillance. Yes. So it was interesting of those patients that um, that in in that registry of multiple institutions, um, it's about evenly uh, separated between those that got active surveillance and those that got some kind of primary intervention. Um, and the interesting thing of it was that whether or not you had an intervention or you didn't, it seemed that the cancer-specific survival was the same. So mm -hmm. lending potential, um, potential uh, credence to the notion mm -hmm. of not really intervening. So we oftentimes talk about, well, when do you intervene? But now there's, there's uh, mm. and I think that there's a lot of other presentations that, that here at ASCO GU where we're asking the question, well, when should we not intervene? Sure. Um, so, or, or take an active surveillance strategy. So I thought that that was an interesting, um, <clears throat> that mm -hmm. was an interesting presentation too. Uh, Monty Paul yeah. is, um, we all know Monty. Yes. Um, so he's got a, a very interesting presentation where he is uh, looked at, um, at uh, circulating tumor cell DNA and looking yes. at genomic alterations uh, between first line and second line therapy where mm -hmm. Um, very interesting. There's a change in circulating tumor cell DNA. There's a change in the number of alterations where it seems to be that there's increasing alterations going from second to first list, second line therapy. And the types of alterations are also somewhat interesting in that there was an increase in P53 mutations or sometimes alterations in the mTOR pathway that might give us a little bit of insight into where and, and how we may treat going into the second line. So I think as these biomarkers develop, I think that there's potential for real um, utilization of this technology in terms of uh, how, how we might treat going sure. into the second line. Um, there's also, uh, there was interesting uh, data, you know, the question of dual combination, dual therapy with immunotherapy is something that's been an, of interest. Uh, you know, the, in, initially with melanoma, you know, got the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab um, seemed to be a very active combination yes. when compared to nivolumab alone. The question is in renal cell, and we saw some early data at, at, at ESMO with the nivolumab ipilimumab combination. At, at ASCO GU, there was a, a small study with pembrolizumab with uh, low dose, uh, dose ipilimumab by Tony Churi, who's. Yes. Um, yes. Small study, but it gives a little bit of a taste in terms sure. of, of, of what this might look like. And I think that everybody's kind of asking the question, how's this going to develop in renal cells? So I thought that that kind of gives us a little additional insight into that. 
Um, the toxicity was as you might expect. Yes. Um, and there was a 20% response, 50% disease control rate, du long duration of responses you might expect with immunotherapy. So I think that it's something, again, that we should be watching for it as in f future developments. Um, <clears throat> I thought some of the, another very interesting uh, study I thought was Nick Vogelzang. Um, he did a economic analysis, a comparative effectiveness analysis using Medicare claims data, wow. looking at frontline therapy in metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma, comparing uh, Votriant or Pizopinib to Sunitinib, uh, looking not only at, as many people do, just looking at the pharmacy data, but also looking at costs of, uh, costs of care, total costs of care, mm -hmm. including office visits, hospitalization, sure. length of stay in hospitalization, total cost of hospitalization, which basically can add up. Absolutely. And basically, um, looking, at, coming up with the conclusion that pizopinib seemed to be a more, um, mm -hmm. less expensive option. Um, and I think, you know, it, he, it was a good it was a good exercise. I think we're going to see more of these kinds of studies sure. as we go into value-based programs all through the United States. That seems to be the big theme. So I think the more we study these kinds of things, the, sure. the better that we'll, we'll get at this in the future. So a lot of excellent information coming out of ASCO GU 2017 here at this meeting. If you can boil it down from all the data that was presented at this particular meeting, can you extract data that's ready to be translated into clinical practice? Quick highlights for our viewership. So I don't think at this ESCO GU there's like really, um, you know, earth mm -hmm. earth shattering changes. I mean, I think um, one one of the things that I may I, I may change my practice in would be looking at the data from uh, D David Bimbatini in uh, Bimbati in mm -hmm. in Italy, yes. um, where there's active there's a cohort of active active surveillance patients in with metastatic renal cell carcinoma tend to be the um, patients that are in the more favorable category or lower tumor burden, the question of whether you initiate therapy, that patients that got active surveillance and didn't even start therapy at all, they, you wow. could just actively surveil them for, and then on average, it took about 20 months to initiate therapy and the patients did just as well, seemed to be doing just as well. To me, that's uh, an area that I may take from this ASCO GU yes. into my practice where maybe we can identify a patient that we can do active surveillance met with metastatic renal cell carcinoma and delay targeted sure. therapy for some time where they won't get as much, you don't, they don't deal with the quality of life related issues and side effects and cost obviously um, for some time and without probably affecting outcome at all. Well, that is extraordinarily important information, and you know we really appreciate your perspective for sharing your insight into this meeting and what might be coming down the pipeline and what other results we expect to see in the future. So we want to thank you very much for joining us for this practice update. Thank you. You're welcome. To our viewers, thank you again for joining us for practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafazula.